Well, good afternoon, Delta Chi. My name is Aaron Otto, the AA International Fraternity President for the Delta Chi Fraternity. And I'm joined today with two incredibly special people to Delta Chi. I'm joined by Judy Armstrong and Joan Evans, who are granddaughters of Myron McKee Crandall. And I wanna tell a little story of how I got to know these incredible ladies in Western New York. In 2007, when we were rededicating the Cornell Chapter House after a massive renovation, I was looking around for the grave sites of our founders. And I discovered that Delta Chi knew where some of them were, but not all of them. And so I found out that Myron McKee Crandall uh, was buried in a city named East Winfield, New York, a city that doesn't exist anymore, which made it very difficult to figure out where the cemetery might be. And so I called a, a city official from West Winfield who said, I might have some records. And when I landed in New York, I was excited to see every one of our founders in New York, except for Myron McKee Crandall, because we didn't know where he was. And that's when I got a phone call from Judy Armstrong. As I remember that phone call going, Judy, I think you said, I understand you're looking for Myron McKee Crandall. And I said, yes, I am. Can you help me with that? And you said, yes, I can. I'm his granddaughter. And I was like, yes, that person came through. So I was able to sneak in a trip to meet and this is back in 2007, Judy, Judy and Joan. So I'll let you say hello. And if there's anything you want to offer before I have a few questions for you about the, the special announcement we're here to make uh, later in this discussion. I know when I got the, I got a phone call from you, Aaron, and I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I was proud and, uh, but it was something we never really knew from our mother. It was on our mother's side and we uh, never knew this. So I, I, the more you talked and the more we found out about Grandpa Crandall, we just were very, awe. very excited. And, you know, wanted to do, I happened to have um, a folder handy with the pictures that I showed Aaron. And I was, excuse me, I was glad for that. And of course, we made the trip over to his, the cemetery and where he lived. And, um, you know, it was just very exciting. And my head got bigger and bigger the more I heard about it and about the good things that the fraternity did and how he went back and forth after he graduated. And he, of course, came back to live in West Winfield. And uh, I, I was just very proud. And, you know, we wanted to do whatever we could to help, you know, do things. And I don't know, Judy, do you have anything more? To well, just fortunate that um, our grandfather, uh, when he was toward retirement age, went in with a, a, a lawyer named Fred Crownmiller. And to tie it in, my husband is a lawyer. And when he first started out, worked with Fred Cronmiller. And so when Fred Cronmiller retired, he had all of uh, our grandfather's furniture. We're not aware of all of these things at the time until you appeared. <laughs> well, that's right. And I remember in that 2007 visit that you referenced the fact that your husband, Lee, was still operating the law firm that Crandall used to practice out of a small law firm, kind of a singular dual, pri dual partner. Right. He used some of his furniture uh, in Cronmiller's office when Cronmiller retired. And uh, then some of it, uh, Lee joined another firm and stuff, so a lot of it was stored. But that's the connection with some of the furniture. Yep. I appreciate that. And I remember a conversation that your husband relayed at that time in 2007 about some of those items and how long they've been carrying on since Crandall would have graduated law school in the early 1890s. And here we are talking right. in 2007. So, um, well, I remembered that conversation in 2007. And I remember us having a discussion about that. And, and in 2019, we moved our fraternity headquarters. And we now had the ability to have some more space than our headquarters at the time from about the mid 1960s till 2019, it was 1969 to 2019, we were operating out of a residential house. And most of our history was in two China hutches and that was all we had space for. And knowing with the newer building we were gonna have in Indianapolis, we would have much more display space for displaying things like for in an educational center. I had this dream based on one of you had planted this seed about possibly bringing something forward that was used in Crandall's law office. And that's, that's when we made the connection because we had an Emerging Leaders Academy back at our home chapter uh, at Ithaca, New York at Cornell. And Ron Martin, the DD and I, our treasurer came down and visited with the two of you and met some of your cousins and other relatives. And that's when the first time we saw uh, the desk that came out of Crandall's law office. And as I remember, it had a lot of character to it, but it also was, a, it was showing its age a little bit in that sense. And 
Um, what we were amazed is, is making the ask of you all considering this, that it turned to be a desk and chair going back to our headquarters. And I believe you all, uh, you know, said yes pretty promptly. And, and then you guys did a huge surprise that I did not expect. There was, what did you guys do to the desk prior to it being shipped to Indianapolis? Well, I had a friend, his name was Gary Griffith, and he does a wonderful job. So he, he did it. And there was a chair. And he did both. He did the chair and the desks. And it was beautiful the way he did it. We were very good. It, it came out very could, well. Yeah. yeah no, it was almost back to new condition. And it's refinishing yeah. both the chair, the table, desk. And it was a flip over desk, if you haven't got a chance to see it in person, that had a typewriter attached to it. And yeah. so the attorney actually found a typewriter that fit exactly the holes that were part of that That's desk. You flip it over. So. <laughs> That's wonderful because it didn't have it. We didn't have a typewriter. To yep. So that's been constituted. And then Ron Martin bought a telephone that would have been period appropriate, <laughs> just a big old black phone with a crank handle on it. Yeah. That's yeah. with it. But um, you and also have a picture in front of it. Yeah. Del, you, you kind of, both of you talked a little bit about some of the items you gave. Would you mind recounting some of the things that are now displayed with the desk in Indianapolis? The picture being one of them, Joan? Yeah. Well, um, it's a picture I had, and I had it enlarged at a, a place near us in, in Utica, and they enlarged it and framed it, and it really did come out quite nice, for sure. You know, we were glad about that. How about you, Judy? Oh, well, I don't, I, as I said, I think uh, Lee had some things, odds and ends of things that we mailed, and I mentioned the uh, fee schedule. Um, things were a little cheaper then than they are now when you hire an attorney. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I'm not sure what else um, yep. went along. Yep, that's exactly right, Judy. There was uh, rate sheets about what a will cost back at the turn of the 20s. And I like that there's pen and ink <laughs> on the side where it went from 250 to $3 in, in Myron's yep. handwriting. Um, in addition, you mailed back a copy of the quarterly magazine, which we put out that, that talked about his passing. <laughs> Right, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so those all said the table, the, the desk, the chair, the phone, the flip over typewriter, and that rate sheet, and that uh, quarterly from that time, and then that beautiful picture. It's like a professional photo of him, I would imagine, in his heyday as being an attorney that you did such a beautiful yeah. job framing. That all sits in one of the corners of this large display room museum, if you will at our headquarters in Indianapolis. And so we so wanted the two of you and other family members to be able to join us in St. Louis for our Yeah, Because we really wouldn't have realized just how important. He was also the district grand yeah. deputy, is it, of the Masonic? Yes, the he was highest way, can go. Yes. I can't mm -hmm. the exact title mm -hmm. of our local Masonic lodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he, you know, he was involved with the fire company and and as I say, basketball, he coached basketball and, you know, he, he, he was, he was involved and loved his community. And, and he, he loved history. Yes. He was a, he was a collector. He yeah. He collected a lot of things. Yes, he did. Well, I just, I think it's incredibly fortunate because of all of our founding fathers, there's only been three families, one barely, one significantly, and then there's you all. And the, the, the one that was the other significant one has since passed. And so just the opportunity to visit, hear a little bit about the way you see people from the different vantage points you have as a family member versus the way we see him when he was graduating and the work that he did and, and helped getting things started that's led to a group that's now 132 years old and uh, has over 125,000 members. And I, I, I kind of would love to have a conversation just like you would from a standpoint from our fraternity's perspective did you ever envision the fraternity lasting this long or becoming what it's become or grown to the size that it is? Because I'm not sure. I think it'd be a terribly interesting conversation to know the future um, from the vantage point of the hindsight is 2020, you know, looking back perspective, but just to kind of think about wh wh where would they have thought of things might be? Would it still be around even five years after they graduated? I'm very pleased and proud the way the fraternity has conducted itself. Yeah. So I'm in Blacksburg right now. <laughs> You know, with that was a new fraternity here yeah. in Blackburg at Virginia Tech. We right, started, Scott? The, yeah, started the group yeah. up a couple of years ago. Been very good, outstanding. Any other thoughts or comments? I, again, I want to thank, can't thank you enough for 
even in 2007, when we drove around and said, there's his house. I think one of you said yeah. there was his in-law's house, not too far away. And, yeah. and we do have it on the fraternity's website. If you want to find where he's buried, it does involve driving through. what looks like a couple of fields, but there's sort of a road there and some details. <laughs> have been there, so nobody it was quite, quite stuck. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, okay. we appreciate all your efforts, and uh, I'm sorry that I'm technologically challenged. <laughs> Glad you could join us on the phone. Thanks, Judy. Just thank you for your part. We're very grateful for the desk. The restoration work was wonderful. We then raised some dollars to get it moved to Indianapolis, put a nice little plaque on it, and then just the display looks so appropriate between the desk, the chair, the phone, the typewriter, and sure. certainly those pieces of you know, like his rate sheets and whatnot being there with his photo it's just as it's a real treat so thank you very much for sharing your grandpa well, with us. we appreciate well the pictures and you sent pictures of it and i i appreciated that and I, you know it was we're grateful for that it was turned out very very well well thank you very much for joining us we appreciate it have a great rest of the day welcome